rocks. We must go with all speed. Yes. Go where? To drown in the sea? How long will the fire hold fear of that? We'll hold After it. this day, you shall see his chariots no more. No! You'll be dead under the... No. The Lord of hosts will do battle for us. I love that movie. This clip actually kind of made me giggle a little bit <laughs> this morning. Maybe I'm just tired. But I started thinking, you know, about halfway through the clip, as the, as the children of Israel were walking through uh, on the dry ground, which is according to scripture, you still see Moses up in the, in the, in the back on the rock, still, you know, still like this. And, you know, a few scenes Later, Moses is leading all of the people through. Like, how did he get from, from the rock to all the way to the beginning? Like, unless he like, had just got like, a new pair of Nikes or something and like, sprinted to the front. I, anyway, it, just, it made me giggle. <laughs> Sorry. And you'll never watch that scene again the same way. That plus the little the, 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 the geese on the flap. <laughs> That was, that was quite ironic to me also. Anyway, what I wanted you to see in this, in this scene was Dathan at the very beginning telling the children of Israel, no, you need to turn around and go back. If you try and move forward, you're going to end up dying. Either the water's going to get you or Pharaoh's chariots are going to get you. So the only option you have is to go backwards. And yet, God's plan was to go forward. When God's plan is to do anything, he will make the way. And we see that very clearly, pictorially, in this scene. God's plan was for the children of Israel to go forward. God made the way, literally, for them to go forward. And that's what they did. Because God's plan will never fail. God needed to accomplish something. It was a very difficult task, but one that he was committed to. See, God needed to cut the umbilical cord between the Israelites and Egypt. He needed to take a people who had been a slave for 400 years, 
with all of the mentality that goes along with it, all of the things that they had gotten used to and comfortable with, and sever it so that they could not possibly go back. And it was going to take a really big scissors to cut that cord. That's why he did it the way that he did it. He had to send them through the sea and close it behind them. You know, we, we talk about, in, in spirituality, we talk about God opening and closing doors all the time. This was one door God emphatically closed on the Israelites. Now, there are plenty of spiritual applications to this. There are a ton of them. And we could talk about this for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. Okay? You could talk about deliverance. You could talk about, I'm not talking about the movie, I'm talking about the spiritual application of deliverance. Okay? You can talk about deliverance. You can talk about redemption. You can talk about, you can even, even talk about baptism in this particular stage. Because that's really what happened. God baptized the entire nation of Israel by taking them through the water. It's fascinating. It's an incredible study. And maybe, maybe we'll, we'll do it at some point this coming year. But there's a very practical aspect to it as well. When the sea closed back physically, there was no way for them to turn around. Not to mention the fact that the entire Egyptian army, according to the scriptures, got, clo got, got drowned and washed away. Okay? It's not like you see here where like, some of the chariots stayed back and you know, they were hanging out with Pharaoh and they watched all the others get, you know, uh, the, maybe the foot soldiers get, you know, get washed away, much to their chagrin. No, the entire Egyptian army died except for Pharaoh. Pharaoh stayed back. But the rest of his army were gone. That's according to the scripture. So even if the children of Israel did go back, find a way somehow, or go north and around the, on the peninsula and find their way back into Egypt, it would not be the same Egypt that they had left. Physically, things were different now. Okay? That was God's plan. Did it work? Sure did. Sure did. They could never go back. And they knew it. They knew it. The song that Moses and the people sang on the far side of the sea reflected their knowledge that God had done something just absolutely positively incredible. They knew it. It was nothing less than miraculous. In the first 11 verses of their song, there are 10 direct references to Adonai or God. Adonai did this. The Lord did that. God did this. That's not even to mention 17 indirect references, being he, his, your, or yours, referring to God. This is what we call giving praise where praise is due. Okay? You'll hear a couple of more cliches that will have different applications today. Okay? Giving praise where praise is due, that's what they were doing. They were acknowledging that the Lord God had done it and not them. It wasn't them and it wasn't Pharaoh. And they were singing so that people would remember that. That this was not Pharaoh's doing. This was not Moses' doing. Moses is doing the singing. And he's giving credit to who? To God. This was God's doing. There is quite a difference, however, between this song and the song that Deborah sings in our half Torah portion. Now, I never looked at these two different songs before. Always, every year, our Torah portion of, of, of Bishalach corresponds to Judges chapters 4 and 5, which is the story of Deborah and Deborah's song. And there is the connection, the song of Moses and the song of Deborah. It wasn't really just the song of Deborah, though, because remember who else sang the song? Barak. It was Deborah and Barak's song, although we just call it the song of Deborah. That's the connection. I never really saw this before. Um, before we look at this, though, I want you to hear me. Love Deborah. I love Deborah. She's an incredible figure in, in Jewish history, in the history of the scriptures, as, as, a, as a woman of faith, as a woman of God, as, as a female leader in Israel. So do not hear me saying anything negative bad, you're negative about Deborah or Barak. This was their song. But the times were different. The times were different. And I believe that there was a different purpose for Barak and Deborah singing their song than when Moses sang that song. Let's take a look at the difference now. 
Deborah's song, in the first nine verses, contains 11 direct and indirect references to God. Okay, this is less than half of the 27 references to God in Moses' song. More noticeable than the lack of references to God are the clear references that Deborah makes to Deborah herself. Think about it. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. They still give credit to God for what happened, but rather than a story of God's power and deliverance, this story, this, this song, was a history of what happened between Deborah and Barak and the armies of Sisera. It was not meant to be a spiritual diatribe. It was not meant to teach spiritual lessons. This was meant to be a history to the people, a way for them to remember what happened between Deborah and Barak and the armies of Sisera that left, that, that left them in a period of 40 years of peace. It was historic rather than spiritual. Does that mean that we can't learn anything spiritual from it? No, of course not. First Timothy says that 